Hello everybody, welcome to The Right Dishonourable. This is the intro thing. Um, uh, I am here, my name is Jazza John. I am rhyming with oranges on the internet. And I am joined by Jimmy. Say hello, Jimmy. Hello, Jimmy. Oh, every time. Will it never get old? <laughs> I feel I have to do it now because I started doing it for a couple of episodes and... Now is this your is this your catchphrase now? Are we going to print that on shirts and give it to the 12 people who listen to this? I was hoping we'd sell it to them, but it probably won't happen. To, to be fair, I don't think it's even worth it. The amount of profit we'd make by selling 12 t-shirts would... It would basically just pay for two days' worth of Starbucks for me. Probably, yeah. Probably. Um, we are actually going to talk about Scottish independence and English... Not really independence, but... English devolution, right? Devolution, yeah. I mean, in reality, Scottish devolution, um, because we're recording this not the Saturday after the independence referendum, but the Saturday after that one. Um, Yes. So, Jazza, what did you kind of make of the Scottish referendum? I'm assuming you kind of followed it as it was going along on the day. Well, yeah, I made um, a quite impassioned video um, uh, where I I basically begged Scottish people not to leave because it would um, screw with my identity so i was very selfish um, so you, you actually sense. feel british rather than english or do you yeah think? like my primary um go-to identity and when people ask me where i'm from i say that i'm british mm. and i i feel very strange saying that i'm english um because of the upbringing that i had where i had like my dad got married in a kilt we celebrate burns night um we used to have huge identity crises whenever England played Scotland in the rugby. Mm. Like, uh, like even though Scottish people will very rightly say that I don't have a right to say that I'm Scottish in any way, because of the ancestry that I have, that kind of blend of cultures that I was brought up with makes me feel more British. Mm. And I would have struggled to have identified with a uh, UK with the head chopped off. Yeah, I mean, I'm I'm probably one of those people who would more describe themselves as English, but I did feel as the refer- referendum was going on, initially I didn't care all that much, but then increasingly I felt like you, that I really didn't want to see the um, United Kingdom broken up. Yeah. Um, but, but then I, I think I think that um, when you listen to the arguments of Scottish independence, and I think if I was Scottish and I were born and raised there, um, I was finding it harder and harder to justify to myself um, uh, to put myself in the shoes of a Scot and not want to vote yes. So I think that if I were born and raised north of the border, I would have at least been swayed and at least been tempted by a yes vote. Um, well, and see, also it, people it really in our age the demographic... the economic argument works out and it wasn't at all clear from any of the, ba- the, the debates that happened. Um See, any, of, any of the information that was given out, what exactly would the improvement be or would it be good or bad? It was a very uncertain vote, I think, for a lot of people. Exactly. Um, and I think um, that's what convinced me that if I was Scottish, I would have actually voted no. I would mm. have been tempted to vote yes, because I love the idea of like starting from scratch and like building a nation. Um, uh, and also, it would have been really easy to get into the Scottish civil service. Um, but <laughs> they, uh, I, I think that they made it very difficult. Um, I know that it was probably Westminster's fault, but there were no answers to a lot of questions. The questions on currency, the questions on the EU. Um, and the yes camp kept on being like, um, we're going to do this later. Just vote yes and then we'll see what happens. <laughs> um, and that is that would have probably made me vote no um, in terms of like the economic argument. But I think that when you vote on the independence of a nation, like Scotland would have been okay economically. Like they weren't going to suddenly sink into the North Sea. Um, yeah, but at the same time, there's no point, um, you know, just doing it for reasons of romanticism and then finding out that you're economically worse off, which for I suppose for the middle classes wouldn't have been that big a deal. But if you're... Mm. You know, if you're poorer than that, then being a bit worse off. Yeah, but it was the poor who bad. voted yes. Yeah, that's true. But then a lot of the re- a lot of really poor people didn't actually turn out to vote in the in the poorer regions. They had the lowest voter turnout. So mm. obviously, Salmond didn't manage to get his point of view across to them. Yeah, it was really exciting to see seventy five percent voter registration and eighty 
Uh, 90, it, was it was it was ninety seven sorry ninety seven percent voter registration and then an eighty five or eighty six percent turnout like that was phenomenal. Although we were always going to get a high t- turnout for something like the independence of a nation, right? But in terms of like the poor record that the United United Kingdom has in big votes like this, um, uh, but it is a completely different kind of vote to a general election, both in oh no, very true, both in what you're voting about and also the fact that it doesn't have the first past the post system messing things up. Um, yeah, <laughs> messing things up. <laughs> well, there's a lot of people I know who. Um, who say, well, I would vote, but I know that X candidate is going to get in because we live in a Tory or Labour borough, or it's mostly Tory where I'm from, I'm not going to lie. Um, Yeah, we're both from that ilk, it's fine. (laughs) It's fine. (laughs) We're uh, just, just, um, because the internet really needed more, like, audio podcasts of middle-class white British guys talking shit about stuff that they don't really understand. Well, you know, someone has to do them. And, uh, <laughs> might as well be us, I suppose. May as well be us. Um, what do you think about the fallout then? Um, specifically, I was curious what you thought about um Alex Salmond deciding to step down. I found that really, really surprising. I didn't really find that surprising. Um, do you I mean, think that there was like a backdoor um uh, kind of deal between uh Cameron and Salmond? And so, and they were well, like, you, you whoever will, loses has step to down. step down. Yeah, like that's what I, I kind of hope that somebody writes like a reveal all autobiography and they like signed a private agreement saying that they'd like whoever lost would step down. I think there, there are two things. I think there's a personal issue for, issue for him because he's just about to turn 60 and his wife is 17 years his senior. Um, mm-hmm. So He looks good though, man. Yeah, yeah, but you know, she's still irrelevant to his policies, but he looks good. <laughs> but anyway, I mean, there's I think there's a personal angle there and he's been leader of the SNP on and off for about 20 years. Um I think there was two long stints and then he took some time off, but it's I think it's been roughly 20 years. Mm. And I think it's it makes sense that he's built he's built his way all up to this and he's done amazingly well as a politician to take what was a obscure eccentric kind of point of view and make it very mainstream mm-hmm. um but yeah i i sort of thought it made sense um george eaton of the new the new statements political editor actually predicted that it would happen but i think for some reason that was a rare prediction it didn't seem like a lot of people made that call. i heard i heard a lot of um people say that um whoever loses uh will not be able to lead their party into the next uh, either Scottish election or the general yeah, election. Yeah. Well, I think um, that and was, I that agree was definitely with that. And true if, of Cameron, uh, Cameron yeah, would I think have been Cameron finished. would have would have uh, like his party would have revolted eventually by then. They're already his backbench is already sick enough of him as it is. What was weird though is that had Scotland left, even though it's obviously a very unionism is a kind of Tory point of view, um, mm. or more Tory than it is the other two parties, it would have benefited the Conservative Party in some ways because. There's a fair chance they won't actually get any MPs in Scotland next uh, next general election. Yeah. Um, so it would have helped them a little bit, but then, you know. No, but then, headless UK, isn't it? And every and when you look at the international media, I don't think there was anybody who um, uh, said that a UK without Scotland would have still been able to maintain its stature on the world stage, which is quite strange when you think about it, because they are only about 8% of the population. Um, uh, They, like, oil revenues make the amount of, like, economic um, input that they do into the UK, like, that's very questionable, and you Mm. can jiggle figures about that and all that kind of stuff. Um, But it's interesting how important the union of Britain as an island actually is, if if any, if not anything, symbolically to the rest of the world. I think they probably overegged it a little bit, though, because um, I mean, had Scotland left, we would have had a slightly um, smaller economy, slightly smaller military. But fundamentally, I don't think it would have changed an awful lot. Mm-hmm. Um, in the same way that I think the the way the vote actually ended up and what Alex Salmond was offering with you know, attempting to keep the pound, keeping the monarch, um, you know, having a very close relationship to the rest of the UK or what, you know, what would be left of the UK mm-hmm. versus this very heightened devolution that they've now been promised. In the end, the vote almost came to nothing, really. It was kind of whichever way it goes, you're going to get roughly the same result. 
So what do you think about this um, uh, heightened, well, Devo Max is what everybody calls it, which makes it sound like some kind of stain remover. Um, but what do you think about the amount of powers that they're uh, being given in the wake of the referendum? It was very much like a, a panicked last minute, like, oh, by the way, you can decide everything now. Oh, God, please don't leave. <laughs> I don't really... I don't know that a lot, you know, that very much will happen before the general election. Then depending on how the general election goes, I think anything could happen, really. Um, mm -hmm. It could just get lost in the wave of, in, you know, in the wave of a new government. Um, they might end up being very extensive powers or they might not be as extensive as was advertised on the eve of the election. Um, well, the main thing is that Scotland will now be able to decide the amount of money that it raises for your taxes, um, which will be incredibly significant because... Um, we've talked about this before. The SNP are actually um, quite uh, fiscally, um, what's the word? Conservative? Or... Um, no, like they, they um, don't tax businesses um, a lot because they want there to be like a significant number of um, SMEs present um, in Scotland. Well, there was a suggestion that they were going to try and create some sort of, um, what's it called? The Irish Special economic like, zone. It's like a, a tiger economy. Um, oh yeah but then that didn't in the end end up very well for ireland because they suffered tremendously during the financial crash and they had yeah. lots of problems with their banks um so maybe maybe not a good idea. but that seemed to be the suggestion that you'd have a low because he made a pro alex Salmon made a promise at one point that whatever the is it capital whatever the capital gains tax or whatever the corporation mm -hmm. tax was in england he would under undermine it um by 2.5 percent or whatever well, I think I think we need that as well in order to like move the, I like he did a talk for either the Guardian or the New Statesman. Like he did a um a speech a lecture, um uh, where he talks about uh, London. It was very poetic language. London was the black hole of the South, and then Edinburgh. He was hoping to turn into the Northern Light. Um, uh, <laughs> and you know what? I liked the, the romanticism. I liked the poetic devices. My GCSE English brain um, uh, was uh, like all of the boxes were ticked for me. Um, but he, I, I think that anybody who doesn't live in London um, uh, is very much in agreement that London's the amount of clout and the amount of power that London has needs to be reduced because it harms the regions and um, the other countries in the United Kingdom. Um, well, there, see, there seems think... to be two kind of ways of viewing it in that you can say, yes, it, it, there's a brain drain that every everyone goes to London mm -hmm. and the economy is just fixated mm -hmm. on London. And that is, that's, you know, bad in a way for the rest of the country. But the other way of looking at it is when you have a mass collection of people and capital and resources in one place, that creates inherent efficiencies that mean that all of those things are put to better use um so i think you probably you have to strike some kind of balance between not undermining london because that will be bad for the rest of the country yeah in terms of you know the rising tide raises all ships kind of argument but by the same token uh, yeah but it hasn't raised all ships has it like the thing is we've seen um a certain amount of strength in the regional cities so for example like newcastle is now a really significant international scientific research hub hmm. um uh, manchester has turned itself into um like they have their own tech developments um and their tech cluster uh, and media um is now a really big part of um what manchester and salford um are significant with since the bbc moved up there um uh, and i think that that is what we need more of obviously london is always going to be the center of the UK's world, because that is just the nature of capital cities in uh, Europe, I think. Um, yes. we're, we're different to um, uh, the US, where they have um, uh, like different industries occupied geographically different um, areas, whereas everything in Europe, like Paris, is the centre of France, and uh, like Rome is the centre of Italy, and mm. Berlin is the centre of um, Germany, blah, blah, blah. Yes. Um, what do you think about um uh, I wanted to go on to like the the English question um and the um West Lothian question that Cameron specifically said that he wanted to tackle 
uh, which is where um, non-English uh, members of Parliament are able to vote on uh, bills specifically that, bills that English only bills. English people. Yeah. Yes. Um, so that's stuff to do with uh, English education, English um, NHS, um, etc. Uh, what do you think Cameron's options are here? Do you think that so there seem to be there seems to be a two pronged option. One of them is uh, the possibility of taking away certain voting powers to non English MPs, yeah. um, which would be, which would possibly be problematic um, because then you may end up having a. So this has been talked about in a lot of media. Um, Labour getting a national majority throughout the whole of the UK, but then when it comes to voting on English matters, Labour would possibly have a minority um which would complicate things but then there's so there's the idea of being able to do that um there's a slight and... va- there's a slight variation on that idea before you sort of go into the next one where you have oh, go on. you have a system this system was uh, proposed by Ma- uh, malcolm rifkind who was a uh, member of the cabinet in margaret thatcher's um, mm-hmm. government and he basically said that you have a system where you vote where all the british mps have a vote on a particular bill and then it gets a majority with them. It goes on to the next stage where, if this is a bill purely affecting England, all the Eng- the English MPs have a separate vote, and it's called a he called it a double majority system where it has to go through both of those, both of those kind of processes before it gets passed into law. Mm-hmm. And then a, a weaker version of that, which was proposed, I think, by Nick Clegg or Ed Miliband, is that you have an English uh, committee that is made up purely of English MPs who get to make amendments to bills before they're voted on by the whole House, which is a kind of weaker form of um, the double majority system. Mm-hmm. Um, but the other option, which I guess you're probably about to go on to, was the idea of an English Parliament. Um, right? uh, not just, well, possibly an English Parliament, but also a regional Parliament. Sure. Um, uh, which would take away this problem of there being, uh, like, specifically... Um, a uh, national majority for a party but then a regional uh, minority when it comes to certain issues and especially when it comes to regional decisions like the NHS it can sometimes seem a little bit counterproductive Um, whereas an English parliament would be the authority um, or a regional parliament would be the authority that voted on stuff like education, NHS, Mm. taxation and things like that Um, in a similar way to um, uh, the assemblies in Northern Ireland Wales and London. Yes. Um, uh, what there are, do you... I mean, there are a couple of problems with all of these. The the problem with the regional assemblies. So this idea, is my favorite one. Um, that, well, the regional assemblies is your favorite one. Uh, yes, the regional assemblies is my favorite. Um, but what are your issues with it first, and then I will see well, if you destroy my dreams. I think I think it's a great idea. I, my issue is not with the idea in and of itself. The problem is that it's the last time it was mooted, which was yeah, under a Labour government. It was was it two thousand four? Yeah. Um, uh, it was. It, it was, was just. Re- it was roundly rejected. It was a really unpopular idea. Even though I think I personally think it's great. There's kind, the kind of variation on that is the idea of having stronger city-based powers and sort of empowering town halls so that you have oh but then the last so we should make this clear for the people who are listening in 2004 there was a um uh, proposal from the then uh labor. tony blair led yeah. labor government to um uh, devolve to have like regional parliaments in the northeast the northwest and in yorkshire and the humber mm. um but it, they their provisional vote which was in the northeast, so it was going to have a regional parliament based in Hull, I believe. Um, uh, that that was um, uh, rejected by a seventy-two percent um, uh, to a like twenty percent um, uh, vote. So the ev- like seventy percent of the people who turned out to vote were like, ah, no thanks, don't want a regional government. Cheers, bye. And so that um, uh, like domino affected the other two votes, and then they never. Um, Went took never took place, um. But then you're saying like cities being able to do uh, like have more powers. Well, we have the same problem because we recently had votes on. I think we had. I can't on remember. on cities having mayors. On cities right? having and mayors, the only one that said yes was Bristol, but it happened yeah. in most of the major cities. So you kind of. Um, have the same I voted there. in the in the Manchester one, and I was part of the um uh, yes campaign um to try and get there to be a Manchester 
um, uh, a, a Manchester mayor. Like, they have a Lord Mayor already, mm. um, uh, the guy with all of, like, the jangly things. Uh, Lord, Lord Mayor's a ceremonial role, like a lot of pretty minor yeah, towns. They do, do a, they do sometimes do a lot of good, um, uh, and to say that they're just ceremonial probably takes away from the, like the amount of work that they do in terms of business promotion they're kind of like as the queen is to the prime minister a yeah. lord mayor is to a mayor it's purely yes. a it's a ceremonial diplomatic kind of role basically yes exactly but they do still do a lot of important work on behalf of the city um so you, but what, yeah what you have um, is, manchester there's no rejected, particular Leeds appetite rejected. for these kind of regional governments even though i think regional governments are probably the answer to you know okay, too much so power the, in London. there wasn't in 2004 and 2009 when these votes took place but is there perhaps now now that we're seeing um now that we've had the uh, scottish independence debate do you not think that there would be, be because these this idea for um england to have more representation um, uh, seems to be, uh, well, from from what I can gather anyway, seems to be quite popular now. Yeah, but I think the problem is that the idea is for English people to have more power over English laws, yes. as the you know as the phrase goes. It's not for you know Yorkshiremen to have more power over Yorkshire laws or Mancunians <laughs> to have more power over Manchester laws. But then that's part of the problematic thing, right? When you have a union, when you have a federation, which is essentially what we're proposing for the UK, um, and then the problem is England is so weighted in terms of like its economy and its population. Mm. You can't have, I don't think that you can realistically have an English assembly that make, that is has so much power over such a significant part of the island. Yeah, well, the... And then to have, like, uh, like the rest of the UK, Northern Ireland, Wales and Scotland, make up um, under 20% of the whole population of the UK. I, and I then agree to have that the, the rest... only realistic solution is to break up England into smaller regional governments, but the, the trouble is that doesn't really seem to be the appetite for it. So either the, the three, you know, major parties just ride roughshod over the electorate and say well, look, you want this thing, but you're not really willing to make it happen. So we're just going to make it happen and you're going to kind of, you're going to have to deal with it. Or they... I would like to see some polling on this. I would like to see how English people would vote on regional parliaments mm. or regional assemblies. To be fair, they're probably never going to be parliaments. Oh, you know, um, whatever the actual name of the body is. But yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, because I, I have a feeling that after all of this um, Scotland independence kerfuffle, there is going to be more of a desire um, uh, for this kind of thing. Um, yeah, I, I think really, I would like to see that happen. Realistically, what I think will happen is that more powers will be given to cities slowly over time, not through any sort of referenda um, where you say vote for a mayor or something, but gradually the power kind of creeps in these cities like Manchester and Liverpool and Newcastle and so on, and that they have a far stronger role in people's lives because most people do live in cities now um and most people i think probably feel just a stronger connection to the city they live in as to the general region um, i think you're being very metropolitan focused i think that there i think if anything um uh, that is going to be more problematic because it i think that it is mainly the rural populations that are most disenfranchised um, uh, from the London-centric uh, political system that we have at the moment. You might be um, right, but I don't think that the rural populations number significantly enough compared to the metropolitan populations. And you, you might say that's a bit callous, but then democracy well, obviously, does tend to so revolve with around a, the, you know, the greatest good for the greatest number of people in rough terms. With a regional parliament, though, like you would obviously have it based in a... Uh, city and then they would also be in charge of like the greater metropolitan and rural area would that not be a um uh, obviously like we both like the idea I, i'm not really disputing that it's a better idea what i'm trying to say is i don't is like... that that's probably what's going to happen yeah, yeah. I, I, I do you think that there's yeah. probably going to be a, a pause and a wait for the next election and then perhaps the uh major parties are going to be campaigning on their ideas for English devolution. I think that, um, that, and that then... will play a part in the general election, I'm pretty sure. What does kind of worry me is that we'll have a general election and so it will, the focus, there will be some focus on English devolution, but I think another issue might come up that takes greater priority, like the NHS or, or EU. whatever. Yeah, EU as well. 
And then the next, we have an election, a new government is elected. And this question kind of just gets put to one side and people say, well, that was kind of eight months ago. And they kind of just shuffle it off. And then we have a process where nothing particularly gets done. And then we have to end up having another Scottish referendum 15, 20 years down the line because no one dealt with the problem. You know, when we have a great, we have a great opportunity to actually deal with it now. But I yeah. think because of the proximity between the referendum and the general election, it might all get squandered. That's what I worry about. I very deeply worry about that as well. But I am like I am a big believer in like dev- devolving like regional powers um, because of the fact that we are so London centric at the moment. Uh, and I would really like to see um, people like John Prescott um and like the i can't remember the mayor of bristol's name um but advocates for like regionalism um uh, like really stand up for this and fight for it i'm worried that it's going to end up um uh, on a lot of white papers in whitehall and being shuffled around people's desks a lot um because also i think that there's the issue that i don't think the civil service is going to particularly like this um because they are very whitehall centric and i think that they will unfortunately make the implementation of the possibility of creating regional parliaments a lot more difficult than it has to be well it'll raise the prospect that some of them you know don't actually live in london which i imagine wouldn't go down particularly well i mean i'm sure some of the Mm. you know a fair amount of civil service is already based elsewhere but look at what the kerfuffle that happened with um uh, when the bbc half the bbc moved up to salford yeah yeah god they basically had a riot (laughs) as much as a bbc journalist can have a riot (laughs) A very small, polite riot, but yeah. <laughs> they went out and had tea and biscuits on the lawn. So I mean, it sounds like you're slightly more optimistic than me, though, that these regional powers will, you know, go through in some form. I think they have to. Um, because also David Cameron, um, he said that he would, um, at, in, on, on the same time scale, begin devolving powers to more powers to the Scottish Parliament mm. as he was um, uh, devolving more powers to uh, England. Um, and we don't know whether he means the regions or England as a country yet. Yeah. Um, the thing that I worry about is that he's going to go down the other route, the non-regional Parliament's route, which I think actually is probably the more uh, likely uh, decision that he decides to end up making, um, where he takes away voting powers from uh non-english mps um because also that fucks over labor like that 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 would probably be the main reason that he would choose that and it's also the easier of the um uh of the options as well because i mean it's one of the cheapest ways of dealing with the problem isn't it it pretty much yeah but it's it's also a shame because it's the majority who are the english mps voting on the future democratic voting rights of a minority of MPs in the Houses of Commons. Mm. And I think that that in itself is problematic. And mm, should I use the word morally? Yes, I'm going to use the word morally. Morally, I think that that is a bad option for uh, to go forward because... This, is, this think... isn't about morality, Jazz, this is about politics. <laughs> no, I know, isn't it terrible? Makes me cry every time. <laughs> Uh, that's it. it seems like quite a good place to wrap it up then, because I think we've discussed more or less... <laughs> what, me, me having a breakdown about morality in politics? Well, before, awesome. before the referendum, you were like having a, like a, a, you know, an existential, existential crisis, crisis and a nationalistic sort of crisis. And you know, yeah. now you can have a devolutionary-based crisis. So. <laughs> Amazing. I can't wait. You know. Um, I actually, I was very, in, like in the video that I made, I was very close to hanging a Union Jack behind me, <laughs> but then I thought, no, too much. And you thought, too, too much, too BMP, we can't, we can't yeah, go down that route. Too BMP. Um, no, it's, it, it got reclaimed during the Olympics, the Union Jack is fine now. Is it fine? Yeah. I'm not, not? I'm not entirely sure it is, but <laughs> okay. It's the, it's, it's the St. George's Cross that is now problematic, EDL, innit? Yeah, I mean, that, that is properly embarrassing. I'd much rather stand in front of a Union Jack than a uh, St. George's Cross. Um, oh, that's a shame, though. Anyway, that's we're going to probably um, keep chatting because we're old grannies, really. Um, uh, but thank you for listening. Let us know in the comments below uh, this video, because although this is a podcast, we still haven't figured out how to do that. So these are still just 
picture video on YouTube. Um, let us know what you think Cameron's going to end up doing for the um, uh, um, English evolution question. Anything you want to ask him, Jimmy? No, not really. No, no. Jimmy doesn't care about you. Like I do. You know, I'm, I'm not, you know, a fully trained member of the YouTube cartel. I don't really do the audience engagement thing. I, just, I used uh... to hate it when you called us the YouTube cartel, but I'm starting to kind of enjoy it. <laughs> it's just like the masochist in you is uh, coming out. The masochist in me is worn very uh, proudly on my wrist. Don't you worry. Okay, say bye, Jimmy. Bye. No, you're meant to say bye, Jimmy. It's your thing. Say yeah, bye, Jimmy. I, I don't want to. I don't want to. It's not the right time. Bye. See yous. Bye. Take a chance, I lost my mind to young romance Yeah, I don't mind, I got it back Half the time I'm waiting for a second chance Half the time I'm glad I feel alright Okay, so uh, we clap after three, okay? Yeah, so, okay, go, go on. One, two, three, clap. Did you clap? I did clap, yeah. Oh, I didn't hear you. I was quite loud. Oh, well, I, it came up on my um, audio wave thing, so I... Your see... audio wave thing? <laughs> yeah. Your I'm... modern technology, it's so exciting. Do you, do you know I write for a computer magazine? Genuinely. <laughs> that <laughs> gen- genuinely happens.